Mariners are looking to take the series versus the Oakland Athletics in Game 3 today after dropping Game 2 on Wednesday night. We're going to talk about this Oakland Athletics series and what it means for the Mariners moving forward. Then going to talk about Logan Evans getting moved to the bullpen out of the starting pitcher role and how that affects his future with the team. And we'll wrap it all up by talking about the Kansas City Royals series coming up at the end of this week. Thank you guys so much for watching episode 93 of the Hit It Here podcast, part of the Believe Network, the Dylan Bauman episode of the Hit It Here podcast. And I am here with Joe. Joe, how are you? You know, I, I felt like there was a chance to be feeling really good coming into this episode. There are opportunities from the offense to score. You had Mason Miller, I don't want to say on the ropes, but him coming in and getting a five-out save, odds on, pretty likely that he's going to get the job done. But Julio had other other ideas, but no one else, you know, caught on to that. And looking back, obviously, Julio, Mason Miller, Mono Imano, maybe you take that live bet on bet online for Julio hitting a home run in the bo- in the top of the ninth to try and allow the Mariners to come back in that game. And if you did it, you probably place that bet with bet online. Thank you to BetOnline for being the sponsor for the Hit It Here podcast. BetOnline is your number one source for the NBA Finals and Stanley Cup Finals this season. Every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads while the games are being played. And when the games are over, do not fret because you can head on over to the online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker or unwind with a variety of different slot games as well. They've got over 150 Head to the website today to get in on the action and use promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% off welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online. The game starts here. Before we can talk about Julio's home run, a pretty miraculous feat given the circumstances, uh, we have to talk about game one, Colton, which you claim to be an abysmal effort from the offense and got a little flack on Twitter. Admittedly, it, you know, it wasn't great in certain moments, but I was there. I was live witnessing it. Shout out my guy, Drake, who recognized me at the game. Didn't remember your name, Colton, which I thought was hilarious. Fed my ego more so than I think anything ever in my entire life. So shout out to you. He's my, saw me after the game too, as we were leaving said, that's my guy, Joe, which was sick. Dude behind me in the line said, yo, dude, you're Joe Lacey. Like right after that. Cause he was just like a random A's fan because that's what Drake said to me. And so it was just kind of funny. And he goes, dude, I don't know who that is. I'm like, dude, that's me. And I gave the, the stranger Nux as well. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Very exciting. What's it like being famous with, like, the six other people that were there? That's sick. I know, dude. It's pretty pretty crazy. Like, it, it's, it, I, like when I go to games and people recognize me, like, the amount of – the ratio of people that know who I am, very small. But for you, the ratio of fans that knew who you were. It was – yeah, I mean, by your calculations, you said there's six fans there. Yeah, that's six. That's sixteen percent. One yeah. out of six. I'm, I'm crushing it. The, the bases loaded early into the game, letting that go by the wayside. Not ideal. A lot of the points that were being made were we had more hits than we had strikeouts, and I think that's probably where maybe a discrepancy is had between understanding like where we're at with what we can expect out of the offense and what we get out of the offense, but also kind of look at it from the perspective of like what team you're facing sure mitch spence has been fine but he was a nobody coming into this year to at least my knowledge if anybody else had their you know pulse on mitch spence coming into the year good for you props to you but the mariners only they, they didn't put up that much i think uh, they didn't they didn't do too much to the a's pitching staff in game one but it was enough to get the job done kirby wasn't vintage kirby wasn't very solid all around kind of got the job done it was just overall it was a weird game in game one colton this game so i want to touch on what you said there because yes the in my opinion this was an abysmal game for the Mariners. they had 10 hits that's great that's wonderful but when you only put up four runs on those 10 hits against mitch spence in the athletics and then you almost lose because your offense just mailed it in after the fourth inning. Like, I don't know how many hits they got after the fourth inning, but they didn't score any more runs. They obviously didn't come through with the bases loaded situation. Good baseball teams put the dagger in the throat of bad baseball teams when they get going. The Mariners didn't do that, and frankly don't do that. And they they don't just run away with games more often than not. Obviously, there was the nine-run game against the Angels, which is much more of an anomaly for the Mariners this year than anything. 
they, it's a game the Mariners should have won pretty handily. Yes, they were up four to one going into that. Uh, I'm sorry, four to two going into that ninth inning, Joe, with Andres Munoz coming in to get the save. Um, we could kind of tell that he he was stretching his back out a lot in between pitches. He didn't really look right, and that kind of came into effect a little bit later on in that inning because you saw he wasn't quite finishing his pitches. He didn't look like he was really in the strike zone. And then, of course, there was a play at the plate where he came up limp, and it looked like maybe it was his ankle, but based on everything we had seen with his back earlier on in that inning, I was pretty certain it was his back. I know everyone on the broadcast was saying ankle, whatever. Maybe it was just a combination of both things happening. They're like, let's just pull him out just to be safe. Yeah. And then things got a little dicey from there, Joe. Yeah, I, I said to you just like, texting you like he didn't seem like he was not his sharpest in his bullpen warming up he looked fine like admittedly where i was sitting i had a great view of the bullpen he looked good i didn't notice anything but of course as soon as he goes out there you start to pick up on those little cues and even like after he exited the game it was a little funky because sauce was getting warmed up in the pen while like Scott and everyone walk, ran out there to go check up on him. And then the fans are booing. The umpires are got, having to go pull Sauce out of the pen. Sauce like took the ball that he was using to warm up, threw it on the ground towards like the bullpen, like kind of in a little bit of a bit of a rage a little bit, just because he's probably irritated that like he's not going to be able to fully get warm how he wants to. He in the defense of you know him not being fully warm, it was still dicey after that. He does catch a comebacker. Was it Brent? Brent Rooker was the final out, yeah? I believe so. Yeah. Future Mariner, apparently. Um, catches a little comebacker, flips it, job done, win four to three. Happy to get out of game one with a win. You're looking to go to game two after fans boo your your injured player walking off the field. You're maybe hoping to go out and get Logan Gilbert a little bit more run support than what they gave to George or what they put up against Mitch Spence. You got Joey Estes. Coming in with a 6 ERA, he was great against us in the first time we saw them. That was the game that we lost 8-1. to one. Colton, Joey Estes was perfect through 6 in this game, in the second game. Obviously, JP broke that up, but it was not a good night offensively. Logan had a, a little pickoff mistake that ended up costing Maron and then another pass ball situation. Not a clean game from the from the Mariners. A game that they could have won, should have won, maybe would have won if those errors if if it's a clean slate. But alas, they do come out on the losing end here 2 to 1. Mason Miller comes out and gets the 5 out save. What is there to take away from this second game? Um I th- I think there's a few things to take away. One, uh Joey Estes owns the Seattle Mariners. Just he's just he like Sorry, John, Mr. Stanton, time to time to step away. Mm. Joey Estes is the owner of the Seattle Mariners because for some ungodly reason, the Mariners suck against him. And not, it's not to say that he's a bad pitcher. He's fine. There's a reason why he's one of their top prospects. But yeah, coming into the game with a 6 ERA, this is what I'm saying. The Mariners offense, it sucks. It just straight up sucks. And in game one, I, I caught flack for saying, everyone's like, oh, well, they had more hits than strikeouts. Cool. I don't care. I could care less. Yes, am I happy that they're striking out less? Sure, I am. But when it doesn't result in anything, like it didn't in Game 2, Mariners struck out seven times in Game 2, had four hits, scored one run. I don't care. You could strike out 20 times. If you win the game, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Like, strikeouts are not the end-all, be-all. And I know that, again, maybe there's something to the fact that they're striking out less now that Brent Brent Brown's gone. Probably not. It might be a little bit of a, hey, look at the competition you're now facing. What after Brent Brown leaves, you face the Angels and the Athletics. Not great baseball teams. Overall, bad baseball game. There was the Ty France, like, little foul ball that he kind of missed over there um, yeah. behind first base. That was rough. And I think that was in that same inning, in that fifth inning. And then, like you said, Logan with the failed pickoff attempt that gets the runner over there to third base. And then Cal just, I don't know what he was doing. The ball just, like, goes right by him. I mean, I to be fair, I was watching my niece's Little League game at the time. And honestly, they played better than the Mariners did. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I didn't get a great view of that play specifically, Joe. That one, he the, the throw to Logan on a dime, the best little pitch he could have done, he just he bobbled it or didn't quite get to the ball immediately. Like when he went to slide out, had he gotten there a second earlier, Daz Cameron is out at home without, without a doubt in my mind. 
Shout out Daz Cameron. Son of son of Mike Cameron. Good good for you. Had he caught the ball? I mean, sure. <laughs> sure. I think, you know, the situation, I, I don't know if there's a situation where he catches or blocks the ball is where I'm probably at with that play. It's then the following instance of him kind of booting the grabbing of the ball initially. But, you know, Julio turned around 102 at the top of the zone dead center. If that's a sign of anything, please, for the love of God, get hot. Because if the Mariners offense doesn't want to do anything for six, seven innings, if Julio is something that can get the, the spark plug going, that would be great, especially going into game three. You got JP Sears on the mound, known kind of owner. Same to Joey Estes, other than his most recent start. Joe, uh, JP Sears last September went five and two thirds, gave up four earned. Every other start before that, he only had given up two earned across like a little bit over like 20 innings. He's got a 2 0 record with a 165 career ERA against the Mariners. Sure different baseball teams from different seasons, whatever. If the Mariners can go out there and attack JP Sears, yeah, he's probably my favorite pitcher on the A's, realistically, starting pitching wise. He's doing okay on the year. He's got a, a four four point zero one ERA. He's a lefty, so we'll see the the right handed bats. Garver got a pinch hit opportunity instead of allowing Luke Rayleigh to try and do something with the bases loaded in the second game, which is another lost cause that. like i don't know dude i don't know what's going on with the the is it like a fetish fetish uh, i'm not even trying to say that word anymore fetish fetishization i can't even say it you, you said you weren't going to try it and you still did i still did his uh, the obsession with the the matchups like it's like he's eating his own foot at this point like he's just it's too much just let yeah. luke really try and hit the ball it was a failure on scott 100 percent. luke really has been one of the better hitters on your team you have the bases loaded with two outs, and your team currently has a big old goose egg. Why do you go to a guy who, yes, I understand that he has been great in the past versus left-handed hitters, or I'm sorry, left-handed pitchers, but Mitch Garver currently is not that is not that player. Yeah. Mitch Garver is terrible this year so far. How do you go with, how do you pinch hit one of your best hitters, or for one of your best hitters, and bring in one of your worst. It just does not make any sense. Oh, because he ha he stands on this side of the plate instead of this side of the plate. Cool. I don't. I, it does not matter. Mm -hmm. Like it, 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 Luke Rayleigh has a much better chance of getting the job done there than Mitch Garver. And then it comes back to bite the Mariners in the butt later because with Mitch Garver pinch hitting for Luke Rayleigh, they then had to put in Victor Robles in left field. Yeah. And then with the game on the line, Victor Robles comes in with Cal Raleigh on first base. Down by one run after Julio hit that home run. People are saying, you know, maybe Bliss should have pinch run for Cal or what have you. I, I can see why you say that, because maybe you get the money bag from Bliss there, and then you ha just need a base hit to bring him in. But the, the failure begins in what, whatever the inning that was, the seventh inning, or whatever it was. I think it was the where eighth. They, was it the eighth? Yeah. And so mm. Robles comes in, first at bat with the Mariners. Another guy who's been terrible just in his career holding a baseball bat. I like, think it was the seventh inning, actually. Sorry. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Yeah, no, his his hit tool is definitely the worst part of Robles' game. Yeah. And he grabs a double play, and the game's over. And, like, Scott Service, again, we have been pretty big defenders of Scott throughout his tenure with the Mariners. Mm -hmm. But he has had his hiccups, and some of them are just head scratchers, and this was one of them. Yeah, just to really put a, a nice little bow on the Rayleigh to Garver situation over the last week just give it a week sample size okay luke rayleigh's got 16 plate appearances garver's got 14 plate appearances just over the last week rayleigh's got a wrc plus of 310 garver's got negative one just over the last week so if you're riding the hot hand i don't care about what their splits look like on their career like rayleigh could be hitting 100 against lefties his entire career you look at what's happening right now why not just give it a shot? Just just try. Try something different. But Lord knows he's not going to be in the lineup tomorrow. Dylan Moore will be patrolling the outfield. Because J.P. Sears on the mound. Opposite Brian Wu. Wu has been great this year. He was great against the Athletics early, earlier in May. Four and a third. Three strikeouts. I mean, that's kind of standard for Wu is short outings of excellence. Hopefully he can get through six. 
I doubt Munoz is going to be available. You know, it's good that he didn't go on the IL. An encouraging quote from him as well coming out today around, like, the game. Just like, hey, I'm with the team. We've done this before. You'll get right. That's my hope. I just, he's probably down the rest of the series. I would have to guess. Maybe then he comes back in Kansas City. But I'm not going to hold my breath on it yet. But ultimately, the pitching can only do so much. The pitching has been fine, largely, for the... I mean, I don't want to say fine. The game game one was kind of messy. Game two, you know, it, was, it was good enough. I mean, the Athletics have only scored five runs, but so have the Mariners. So you have to go out there and just hit. You have to go out there and score something. And that's the big thing in game three. Is like if you're going to push out the right-handed lineup because J.P. Sears is on the mound, you better hope they're hitting home runs. You better hope they're hitting for extra bases. You better hope they're trying to get guys to cross home plate because if it's not working again for the third game, in a row, if you if, you know if you want to count the first game, the the Brant Brown whatever it's it was a nothing burger against Anaheim at this point. The the sample size of what we have with this team recently is yes the Mariners have won four of their last five and I think like seven of their or eight of their last ten. This the is Mariners the first playing, loss in June. Yeah, they're playing good baseball right now. Don't get me wrong, I am just upset that. With what we're seeing with this team, they're not taking advantage of the team. This is the month of June is their time to go out there and make hay in in this in this division in this league right now. And it's stupid little losses like the one to Oakland today that or almost losing game one to Oakland. It's things like that that can just tr have a trickle down effect that affects the rest of the uh, the rest of the month. Mm hmm. And I think that moving forward against J.P. Sears, the Mariners have to get right. I do want to say, though, I'm not sure that it will be Dylan Moore out there in left field. I think it'll be Victor Robles with Dylan Moore at third base, Joe. No, that's and a good Rojas point. not being in the lineup, mm. if I had to guess. Okay. I also, but with that being said, there's also a chance that we see Mitch Garver behind the plate. Maybe Cal gets a day at D.H., um just to keep you know because it's true night they, game they did game after a night game they did endorse garver as a catcher you know mm -hmm. gave him some props and kirby had some encouraging comments about his work back there yeah it'll be interesting to see i mean by the time you guys are hearing this you'll probably know the lineup so i don't know i i have again pretty optimistic i have faith that they can go out there and win this series i said mm -hmm. that i wanted it to be a sweep so close so close to being able to go for it tomorrow, today, but I don't know, dude. You just have to go out there and score runs. That's that's the one, the goal of the game. Score more runs than the opposing team, and you win. It's amazing. Whoa, I know that's crazy, Joe. But hey, we talked a little bit about Andres Munoz, and we know how important he has been to this team so far at the back end of that bullpen. Because without Brash, without Santos, so far this year, he's kind of been the only guy. But the Mariners may be working on getting another guy that can throw late innings out of this bullpen. And that is one of the Mariners' best pitching prospects, Joe, in Logan Evans, who they just converted to a reliever. The rumor is that by the second half, by after the All-Star break, he might even be up with this big league bullpen, Joe, along with Gregory Santos. Yeah, there's a lot of conversation happening in Oakland. Jerry Depoto said today here in Oakland, the Mariners are legitimately considering Logan Evans for their major league bullpen as soon as the second half, as a tweet from Daniel Kramer. Logan Evans has been nothing short of amazing in Arkansas, and we all know that's the last pitching stop for pitching prospects in general in the Seattle Mariners organization. He just won Texas League Pitcher of the Month on his birthday, I'm pretty sure, as well. Oh. Went 4-1 and one with a .63 ERA through five starts, striking out 33 batters over 28 and two-thirds innings. But you're moving him to a reliever role out of almost a necessity. You're scarce on high leverage arms, and maybe they're trying to strike lightning a third time, you know. a broken uh, The Mariners' broken clock is right three times with converting starting pitching prospects into quality, above quality, relievers it started with edwin diaz we all know about sugar we all know about what electric eddie d did as soon as he was converted from a reliever or from a starter into a reliever colton you said it was what two weeks in 2016 for when, like when he yeah. transitioned and then made his major league debut what did edwin diaz turn into one of the best relievers in all of baseball one of the best closers and 
rough outing for him in 2024. Hopefully he's able to get back to where he was. The Seattle Mariners made the most, I'd say, out of what he, they like what they got from him. He was incredible. He was Andres Munoz before Andres Munoz was a Seattle Mariner. Like they've shown that they could do this. They've shown that at times when they needed to, they can produce a quality reliever almost out of thin air. They took a starter, Matt Brash, the second of this situation. He was a starter. Had a 7.65 ERA in five starts for the Mariners in 2022. They sent him down, turned him into a reliever, and in 34 appearances, he came back up to a 2.35 ERA. One of the better high leverage arms for the Seattle Mariners in the playoff busting, whatever, drought busting 2022 season. Integral to the Mariners' success that year. Mm -hmm. Was phenomenal for the Mariners last year. Led the league in appearances. Unfortunately, he's got Tommy John. The Mariners need high leverage arms. You mentioned Andres Munoz. If he's out for longer than just these two games, whatever, I'm hoping it's just the rest of the A's series. Like, he's back against Kansas City. We can't have Ryan Stanek closing out games for too long. You know, it can only be, you know, sparingly. Mike Bauman was pretty solid, I'd say. He's been very good ever since his first outing. But transitioning Logan Evans with a primary two seam, a slider that's pretty devastating to lefties and a cutter that you can play off of that two seam to righties. The runners know what they can do and they can turn him into or what they hope they they can turn him into as far as a high leverage reliever is concerned. I'm not counting chickens here. But if there's a team that can do this, it's the Mariners. It's they can turn him into maybe not the ninth. Maybe not the eighth but a solid seventh inning guy that you can then allow your bullpen to readjust and establish different roles. Cause once Santos is back, you think, who do you think comes back for, who do you think is there first Santos or Evans? Do you think Evans, you think Evans is up first Santos is there then say like a month after him, say Evans comes up in July. Evans is not whatever, you know, it doesn't matter for all intents and purposes. Like you're going Evans in the seventh Santos in the eighth Munoz in the ninth. If it all works out. Or you can even go Stanek in the 7th and have Evans do a swingman in the 6th. or However it works, it's just lengthening your bullpen, giving you better options than what you've got now. Both has been okay. Trent Thornton had a pretty rough outing against Oakland in the first game. Obviously, against the Angels, he was the one that allowed all the base runners on to then sauce, give up the grand slam. So Thornton hasn't been as sharp as he was earlier in the year. Gabe is out. So the Mariners, this is a necessity for them, I think to move Logan Evans off of a starter into reliever. I don't know if that confirms him to be like done being a starter for the, you know, he can go back, you know, this isn't the end all be all. Cause I feel like you more than I'd say the vast majority of people online are kind of hesitant about this situation, moving him off of the starting pitching because how thin we are. What are your, like, let, lay that out. Yeah, I mean the Mariners are like like you said, they're thin on like major or major league quality starting pitchers. You have Emerson Hancock, you have Jonathan Diaz, Dallas Keuchel, maybe. Ugh. I don't know, but then it's Logan Evans. Like it, it for what the Mariners have going forward, and especially as a trade chip, he is much more valuable as a starting pitcher than he at than he has than he is. Hmm. Whoa, than he is as a reliever, and so. Well, I don't think the Mariners were planning on trading Evans anyway, but if they were, if they were trying to put all of their chips and push them all in and say, hey, you know, we're going to go get a junior or something like that, and the Blues are like, well, we want a starter, Logan Evans would be the guy that they would want. Mm. And that's not to say they still wouldn't want him even now. Like, like, like they, like they, even if he's a converted to a reliever, they sit, they'd be like, we'll take him, we'll just convert him back to a starter. And that's why I'm okay with it for the most part. The only thing is, is the Mariners do have guys. It's a lot easier to go out there and acquire an, a reliever. So does this hinder his development as a starting pitcher? I doubt it. Maybe it does in some way, somehow, because he gets used to just airing it all out over an inning or two. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not a pitching expert. I have no idea. But like you said, and he doesn't have to come up and be Edwin Diaz. He doesn't have to come up and be Matt Brash. He just needs to come up and be a major league quality reliever. Mm -hmm. The Mariners have guys that can do that. I mean, Carlos Vargas is still down there in AAA. 
Uh, I don't know really what he's been up to lately, but he has a 279 uh, ERA on the year in 19 innings pitch, which I feel like sounds very similar to what it was last time we talked about it. So maybe he's hurt. I don't know. But the Mariners, they just added Mike Bauman, who I think could be a guy who can be that bridge. And like he could be the seventh inning guy with Stanek in the eighth and Munoz in the ninth. But you can never have too many high leverage relievers. You can't. Um, especially with how bad this bullpen has been this year. I think that it's okay. I mean, bad is a relative term. They've been relatively decent. But lately, especially after finding out the brash is out for the year, Santos not coming in, Stanek being shaky, and Gabe being hurt. Obviously, Sauce was hurt for a little while. Adding a guy like Logan Evans to that bullpen, Joe, is going to be really important because we know that pitching wins ball games, And more often than not, that's how the Mariners have always deployed their roster. And if you have guys, especially like Brian Wu, who is always on this pitch count where maybe he's only going to throw 60 pitches and he got you through five. Okay, well, now you have four innings to cover from the bullpen. Guys like Logan Evans who can, A, come in there and probably be, probably have pretty devastating stuff for an inning, maybe two, but can also, if you need him to, go out there and bridge you three, four innings because he was a starter. Mm -hmm. And he, he can give you length out of that bullpen if you need him to. So whether or not you want to do that, maybe piggyback him off of Wu sometimes, that's an option as well. I think that overall, this is a good move on the Mariners' part. And like you said, maybe even coming into camp next year, they convert him back to a starter as things get a little bit more ironed out with this bullpen going into 25. Yeah, you mentioned like him being able to go more than an inning. Like His first appearance since being moved out of the a starting pitching role, he went two innings. It's probably just to kind of maybe like ease him down, like wean him off of throwing typically like six innings or however you want to call it, but... This move, if it pans out right, could be like this is like the what we're all thinking like, oh, we'll get Matt Brash back by June. This is that type of move potentially. Like he could have that high of a ceiling. You're saying he doesn't need to come in and be Edwin Diaz, doesn't need to be reliever Matt Brash. We're not trying to set super lofty expectations, but with his how he's done since being in double A, like really just all the endorsements by the front office and everyone like that, it's hard not to imagine greatness, if that makes sense. It's hard for me not to sit here and be like, yeah, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm hyped. Bring Logan Evans now. I want it. Like, it's just, maybe I need to temper my my expectations a little bit. And a team, Colton, that you set pretty high, lofty, you know, expectations for at the beginning of the year, your World Series bound Royals, that's the next opponent for mm. our Seattle Mariners finishing up the athletic series we then have a three game set starting on friday in kansas city probables aren't listed on an lb.com don't fight me don't don't do anything don't yell at me i don't think anyone actually ever has like yelled at me for messing up the probables at any point but bryce miller versus daniel lynch the fourth fun fact in game one on friday colton the royals just had a game postponed against the guardians on wednesday Maybe they'll play a doubleheader. I don't know if it got rescheduled to Thursday. If they're playing a doubleheader, we might catch a a nice little tired Royals team coming in on Friday. They're currently second in their in their division behind those Guardians. No, not not a doubleheader on a uh, Thursday. At least not listed as a doubleheader. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't imagine be a doubleheader on a Thursday. It just it'll be made up later. That was my my hopium. But Bryce Miller versus Daniel Lynch the fourth. Apparently he's the fourth. I don't know. Miller's looked really good. The Royals are a good team. We took two out of three from them earlier. Of course, now we're in Kaufman. I'm just hoping it's nothing like that series last year. We did win that series, but like it was terrifying from start to finish. Just give us, a, I don't want to say an easy game, because it's never going to be easy, especially against the Royals, but like, just don't torture us again, please. The Royals are a very good baseball team. <laughs> not not a bad baseball team. Not a bad baseball team. The Mar did they already play them once this year? They did, right? right? Took two out of three. Yeah, yeah, two out of three, like you said. Bobby Wood Jr. is ridiculous. Correct. He is like and, and Salvi's been really good so far this year, too. Offensively, if you can stay away from Bobby Witt Jr. and Salvador Perez, you're probably in a good spot. But the pitching for the Royals is good. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know everything there is to know about the Royals, other than the fact they're going to win the World Series this year. Of course. But what I can tell you 
is that this is another team that is built very similarly to the Mariners that has always, I mean, that's how, that's how they won their world series back in 2015. I Mm -hmm. think it was where they was built on pitching with Wade Davis, the back end of that bullpen. Uh, Kelvin Herrera, I think was there at the time. Uh, Obviously you had Hosmer, you had Moustakis and whatnot. So you had your guys around the, around the diamond that were good. Alex Gordon, I think was on that team back then, but this team now is still built very similarly to the Mariners where it's very pitching heavy and you have guys in the middle of your lineup. Obviously for the Mariners, it's supposed to be like Julio and Garver. The Mariners don't really have those guys that are hitting like Salvi and, and Bobby Witt right now. But going into this game, I do feel confident that this is a series the Mariners can still win. Again, it is Kaufman, but Bryce Miller has been good enough against some of the best teams in baseball this year. Obviously we saw what he did against the Braves. That start just sticks out in my mind. Every single time I talk about Bryce Miller, the Mariners offense has maybe been better. It's really hard to say right now because obviously we're coming off of a game that we just watched that was God awful offensively, but we're also coming off of a series where we watched them take care of the angels. So what offense was the real offense for the Mariners? Was it the, what we saw against the angels or was it what we saw in game two against the athletics and what we've seen mainly throughout the entirety of this year? I'm not sure. But the offense is going to need to come out swinging in this first game against Daniel Lynch. Yeah, the Royals, like you're saying, good baseball team. They're 36 and 26. Like, they would be leading the American League West. You know, our Mariners would be behind them in the standings. We're sitting at 35 and 28. So what I normally do in the comparisons for teams leading up to the previews, right? I usually compare Team WRC Plus to Team Pitching ERA. And the discrepancy for the Mariners is always that the Team ERA is a lot better than the team that we're facing. If it's a middle-of-the-road team, a good baseball team like the Royals, Colton, you said that they're, I don't want to say built on pitching, but their pitching's very good this year. Um, They're just behind the Mariners. They're eighth in all of baseball. Mariners are sixth. Uh, The Mariners got a 3-4-3 ERA. The Royals got a 3-6. And, of course, we know the Royals' offense is much better, considerably better than the Mariners. A 102 WRC plus compared to the 95 WRC plus that the Seattle Mariners are posting. You have to, you, you just have to out pitch and hope that the offense does something. And in game two, Luis Castillo, who's been very good, very much so ace like return to form, Luis Castillo against Alec Marsh. And the last time the Mariners faced Alec Marsh earlier in the year at home in T Mobile, he went five innings, five hits. Gave up an earned run. That was, I believe, the weird... Was that the weird Brian Wu start where uh, Mr. Umpire Man had to exit the game? I believe was it was. It? Was that the Royals? I think so. Huh. Yeah, he struck the out seven. You know. Alec Marsh has been pretty solid on the year. Didn't have a great start out last time against... Uh, either the the Twins or the Padres. So hopefully he continues those pitching woes and the Mariners can take advantage of that in the second game. But Colton, the the real test, it it, it is the final game of that Royal Series on Sunday against acquired last year, I think in the Araldis Chapman trade, Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Cole Reagans on the mound against the Mariners, against George Kirby in that final game on Sunday. That's a, that's a, that's a pitching ninja matchup of 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 all time i'd say like that's up there that's that's gonna go in the louvre if it's a if it's a great start from both of them i hope it's not for cole reagan's i hope it is for george kirby because we're gonna need all the wins we can get especially against these good baseball teams if we're maybe not sweeping the athletics when we need to this royals team colton they're gonna put the mariners to the test i hope the mariners can win this series this is a series where i'm borderline don't get swept Whoa. Uh, against against the Royals, I know, but that's just because the Royals are a feisty team. I do worry about George Kirby versus the Royals. I think last year in that final series versus the Royals, he got hit around a little bit. If I remember correctly, I could be very off. Um, but he, uh, George specifically, we know how around the zone he is, and we know how good the Royals are at putting the ball in play and making things happen. When you have the guys that you have on that team. That's what you have to do offensively, and that is what they do so, so well. We saw it last year. It was kind of like a Twitter meme about how awful it was to play the Royals. Well, the Mariners are going into their house and facing some of their best pitchers, and honestly, offensively, 
I don't think the Mariners are anything special right now. The pitching staff has been good for the Mariners. And we saw, of course, we saw Logan not, or not Logan, it was George, I think, that didn't get through to the sixth inning. Mm -hmm. Uh, He only pitched five. He struck out nine, however, in that athletics game. Logan pitched all right, gave up the one home run, of course, to uh, Zach Geloff, right? And then had that. Was it an unearned run, that second run? I'm not. It was the pickoff that he allowed him to get to third and then a pass ball. So, yeah, so maybe, but in terms of the Mariners pitching staff right now, they've been good. Obviously you won't see Logan in this series versus the Royals. Castillo has been really good. Miller's been very good. I just don't, just don't get swept. Final answer about how I feel about this series. Don't get swept. Win at least one. If you lose the series, it's not the end of the world as long as you take care of the athletics in game three. And that's going to do it for episode 93 of the Hit It Here podcast presented by Bet Online, the Dorian episode of the Hit It Here podcast, and go Mariners.